Welcome everyone to Lenten Tin Luncheons Week 4. Um, I'm glad you're all out there. It is me, Pastor Paul Walker, and uh, we're going to get right into it as we usually do. And feel free, if you're watching this later, to still leave a comment. Let me know if you had any thoughts about what we touched on today. So, uh, as always, we're going to start with You Are the Beloved by Henry Nouwen. Beautiful book, but here's our reading today for March 27th. It's titled, God's Love is Stronger Than Death. Here we go. He writes, Even though Jesus went directly against the human inclination to avoid suffering and death, his followers realized that it was better to live the truth with open eyes than to live their lives in illusion. Suffering and death belong to the narrow road of Jesus. Jesus does not glorify them or call them beautiful, good, or something to be desired. Jesus does not call for hero heroism or suicidal self-sacrifice. No, Jesus invites us to look at the reality of our existence and reveals this harsh reality as the new way to new life. The core message of Jesus is that real joy and peace can never be reached while bypassing suffering and death, but can only be achieved by going right through them. We could say, we really have no choice. Indeed, who escapes suffering and death? Yet, there still is a choice. We can deny the reality of life or we can face it. When we face it, not in despair, but with the eyes of Jesus, we discover that where we least expect it, something is hidden that holds a promise stronger than death itself. Jesus lived his life with the trust that God's love is stronger than death and that death, therefore, does not have the last word. He invites us to face the painful reality of our existence with the same trust. This is what Lent is all about. Henry Nouwen, you are the beloved. All right, now we're going to get into our scripture passage today. So we have a pretty lengthy one, and it's from Luke chapter 15. And we read, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and against, or against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. 
and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has con come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. The older brother... Sorry, going in again. My son, the father said, You are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So that's a pretty famous parable, and some of us know that parable as the parable, parable of the prodigal son, which is singular, but this is actually a story about two sons and a father, and we're actually meant to compare and contrast them. So we have this younger son, he, he desires his father's wealth, he goes up to his father and he's like, give me your inheritance, and you know, sometimes we think like, oh, this is just, you know, a parable. This son is just greedy. But it's actually a bit more shocking than that. Because when you want someone's inheritance, you can only collect that when they're dead. And so by the son actually going to his father saying, I, I want your inheritance, he was saying a lot more than just, please give me some money, right? Um... David Wenham in his commentary on this passage says, The younger son in demanding his share and turning it into cash was flouting convention, ignoring his God-given responsibility to care for his father and mother, and more than that, insulting his father, saying in effect, I wish you were dead. The younger son doesn't care about his family. He only cares about himself. And he goes off and he, and he has wild living, the text tells us. So that's one son. And then we have the elder son. The elder son's a bit different. He's the son that stays at home. He, you know, by his own admission, he, he works hard. He, 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 he's a good steward of things. But we find him in the story outside the house. And I'll come back to that. Because we also have a father. And if, what we notice about the father is that the father goes out to both sons. First, we, we see him running out to the younger son. Like, he's filled with compassion, which generally in that day, fathers didn't act like this. But he runs across the field, he hikes up his uh, his tunic, and he, and he embraces his lost son. And he you know, dresses him in a robe and kills the fatted calf. He throws a huge party and he refuses to let the son try to work his way back because that was the plan all along. The younger son was like, you know, I, I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll ask to work in my father's house. I'll be a servant. That's the position he was hoping for. What he didn't expect is that he would regain his sonship. But that's the kind of father that Jesus tells us here. Now back to that elder brother. Because the elder brother, just like the younger brother, he's outside the house. He's, he's refusing to join the party. He's distanced himself. And the father goes out to him and he begs him. He pleads with his elder son, join us. We had to celebrate. Come on, you're... you're, you're your brother is, he, he was lost, but now he is found. But the elder brother won't have it. He is separated, not by awful behavior, like he, he's not like directly disobedient, but he's separated from the father because of the good things that he's done. He's separated from the father because he actually thought his obedience gave him a position and a relationship with his father. Whereas it seems in this story, the father's relationship with his children is out of love, out of relationship, out of a concern for and a compassion for them. And that's what the elder brother didn't understand. He, he didn't understand that the father's love would cover this kind of sin. You know, does that remind you of anyone, that elder brother? Well, I think it's interesting that before Jesus tells this, story, this parable, we're actually told that 
of this little passage in Luke 15, 1 and 2, where it says that the Pharisees were muttering or complaining against Jesus. They said that this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And I think the elder son is actually the picture of the Pharisees, who, when you think about it, in their engagement with Jesus, they were on the outside of his ministry. They, they would exclude others, and excluding sinners, they excluded themselves from the God who comes to save sinners. And that's the danger of always sitting in a position of, of self-righteousness, a, a position that says, listen, I, I've always obeyed. I've always had it all together. But that's not, that's not how we have relationship. And I think that's what probably shocked the elder son is that, is that the father still desires a relationship with the younger son and him, not based on what they do for him, but based on the generosity and love of who the father is. And if we could understand that, that would change our lives. Because all of a sudden we begin to walk in grace. We begin to we begin to be thankful that we have a father that will restore us even when we do wrong like the younger son. And even when we want want to distance ourselves from our younger brothers. Like the father wants us both. He wants he wants restoration. Now there is something that I find curious in this. This elder brother really doesn't care about his younger brother. I know I have two younger brothers, and if one of them was missing and I didn't know where they were, I would like I would launch an expedition. I would try to go find my younger brother, um, but not this younger brother. He could care less. He just wants to b maintain a position of authority back home, and I think that's kind of tragic. Tim Keller, he puts it like this. Uh, he says, what a horrible elder brother. And the truth of this parable, writes Tim Keller, is that Jesus gives us a bad elder brother so that we will long for a true one. And the truth of this parable, when we, uh, as with all parables, when we bring it back to the story of Jesus, is that Jesus is our true elder brother. That when he hears that his fellow brothers and sisters have gone astray, he mounts a mission to rescue us. And Jesus comes and brings us back to the Father at his own cost, his life. And that is the gospel. That God loves us and desires a relationship for us and sent Jesus, who in his life teaching and death and resurrection announces a new kind of world. All right, that's our scripture reflection. We're going to close today, as we usually do, uh, with covering our prayer book. So this is our prayer book written by Scott Erickson and Justin McRoberts. And it's actually a series of prayers, and then I'll, uh, I'll let you guys go. Uh, but first, I'll check the comments. Oh, uh, Osho says, hello. Nice to meet you. Caroline Clausen, I see you on there. Mrs. Weens, I see you there too. All right. <laughs> Greetings to you all. So I'm going to read our various prayers. So here we go. This is our next image. So as usual, I will speak the prayer and give us a moment of silence just to stare and contemplate. May I speak into the lives of those I love because I love them and not because I think I'm right. Even in conflict, may I see people as beloved instead of problematic. May I have the vision to see this day and the work that comes with it as a gift.
May my limitations be doorways to partnership and relationship rather than reasons to feel shame and isolation. May I learn what it means to have enough and abandon the relentless pursuit of more. May love and forgiveness for others be less and less optional. I'm going to close our time today by reading a reflection from our prayer book here. And the title of this reflection is titled, uh, Changing the Toilet Paper. The cabbie was an older gentleman who eagerly, eagerly and quickly engaged me in conversation. During our short talk, I mentioned that I would be married soon. Married, said the cabbie. So you love her, do you? Yes, sir, I sure do, I said. Well, son, he paused, glancing at me in the rearview mirror. You be sure to change the toilet paper before she asks. I turned to gaze at the scenery as it streaked by in the window. You bet, I said, as if his comment made all the sense in the world. In reality, I couldn't figure out how he went so quickly from getting married and being in love to doing the chores. What was that all about? He seemed to pick up on my disconnect and he said, I'm serious now. You gotta do that. All right, I assured him. You've got it. I hoped that would be the end of the conversation, but it wasn't. The cabbie then said to me, Kid, you don't get it. I lost my marriage. I should have changed the toilet paper. Looking up, I could see him staring at the road in front of us, shaking his head. I'm telling you, the cabbie said, talking to himself as, as much to me. I'm telling you, it would have made a difference. He was right. I didn't get it. But I remembered that conversation and have been a regular toilet paper changer throughout the course of my marriage. It turns out that being on toilet paper duty is less about doing a simple chore and more about loving my wife. It has been about a living a posture of service. I've learned that the little things don't add up to a healthy sorry, I've learned that the little things don't add up to a healthy relationship. They are symptomatic of it. Changing the toilet paper serves as a practice of sorts. For my heart. It is a discipline, a habit that roots me in a love that gives. I have to take time and energy away from something else in my day, something I would rather be doing, in order to change the toilet paper. And it would seem that doing so is a small thing because it takes only a short moment. Even if the paper rolls are on in another room of the house, it's not the size of the job. But when I do it, it's my will. And if I'm unable or unwilling to do such a small thing for my wife, it is less likely I will serve her well when it actually costs me or inconveniences me. So it is with prayer, sacrifice, or any spiritual practice. Take fasting, for instance. 
Skipping meals can seem only loosely associated with the practical, daily occurrences of life. But I found that voluntarily and regularly removing a comfort from my life readies my heart to make more urgent everyday sacrifices when they are called for. When my neighbor's work schedule changes and her son needs a ride to school, when my friends can't pay their rent or mortgage, when a war terrorizes a country, or those left behind need to rebuild. When a drought comes and hope seems to dry up with the land, when the shaky gr ground of politics opens up and swallows whole families and cities and nations, will I be practiced enough at the art of sacrifice to respond with courage, hope, and wisdom? Prayer and fasting can seem divorced from normal life. But the posture I learned to live in, particularly as I voluntarily give up my own comforts, prepares me to give away myself from when the time comes to do so. All right, that's our reading today. It's been great uh, being with you all. Um, Carolyn Clausen, I do see your comment. It's not about the toilet paper. Knowing what the toilet paper is really about is all the difference. So true. Um, so today, may you change the toilet paper. May you know the little things that you can do to bring God's shalom, his peace on this earth. And may you know the love that Jesus loves you with. I'll see you guys next week.